Well, thank you guys so much for being here tonight. Before I even start, I want to give a quick disclaimer. Even though I could play a really good doctor on television, I am not a doctor. Um, I'm also not a nutritionist. I am not a professional cook. I am just someone who was diagnosed with kidney disease seven years ago, and I have been on this journey for a lot of time feeling quite alone and not like I had a lot of answers or inspiration. And when I started figuring out um, how to do this and do this in a way that felt effortless and felt really fun and I felt full finally, um, I realized that I thought I had some information that could perhaps help others. And that's why I'm doing what I am today. But everybody and everybody is different, especially when it comes to salt. So it's one of those things like healthcare in general that when you start being proactive and doing things beyond Western and Eastern medicine to help yourself, um, it's really about figuring out what works for you. The tips I'm sharing with you today is what works for me and is perhaps a jumping off point for you. But find how you feel on a you know, lower sodium diet, talk to your doctors, talk to your nutritionist. But what I'm going to share with you today are all the things that you can safely do with your own two hands to take health care back into your hands. So to start, I wanted to know who here, because I know I have some wonderful family members and friends who are supporting me, but I want to know also who is here because they've been told by their doctors that they or a loved one has to limit their sodium intake. So a lot of you. <laughs> and how many of you thought, hey, that sounds like a lot of fun? <laughs> okay, so none of you. And how many of you actually think that you've taken on a low sodium diet? Okay, I, I don't want to put anyone on the spot, but I'm going to. Um, would anybody mind sharing what their typical day of eating looks like that's on a low sodium diet? And I'll just say first, we're very proud of you. Would you mind in this sector? <laughs> <laughs> I locked my eyes on you. I, I don't eat out a lot okay. at all. That was like the first thing that I eliminated and I prepare most of my own food. I don't add any salt to make sure to eat whole foods, mostly like grains and fruits and vegetables. And you know, Great. So doing she's, all of those things, there's no salt involved in that. So. Wonderful. So she said she doesn't eat out a lot. She's cut, you know, putting salt on her foods out of her eating habits. And you're eating a lot of whole foods. Is there anything that you are really missing? I miss eating out, being mm -hmm. able to, you know, engage in that social, so I like to eat. I like yep. I miss not having to think about what I'm eating. So she all. says that she's missing the social aspect of food and eating out and being excited to eat. Um, and that's what I'm really excited to talk to you about today because I love food a lot. And especially in the Bay Area, we have so much good food. And while we're here to talk about nutrition and food and health and food, what food really is to us is comfort and excitement and entertainment and, and socializing. And so when you're told to change your diet, it's not just what you're eating that's changing, you think your whole life is changing. Um, so like I said, I know exactly where a lot of you were. I was handed the DASH guide, which um, to say the least, wasn't very inspiring or informative. Um, and this is what I kind of thought were the rules of living a low sodium life. No salt shaker, as our wonderful participant said. No canned items. No convenience food. Forget about snacking, uh, eating on the go. How do you even do that? No salt heavy sauces. No eating out, or at least not eating any exciting foods. So I thought this was a life of steamed vegetables, steak, and being by myself in my kitchen. Um, but why I'm here is because I actually found it is way more exciting than my life was before. Before I was diagnosed with kidney disease, I, my favorite foods were fried chicken, macaroni and cheese, and pizza. So talk about a very big switch. And I'm not talking fresh macaroni and cheese. This is Stouffer's macaroni and cheese where you put it in the microwave. Some of the plastic actually kind of gets into it. And really not healthy, fresh food. Um, 
And I, I started realizing when I was doing a low sodium diet, and we'll talk about this later, but trying to mimic Indian cuisine and African cuisine, I would ask people, well, I don't actually know what Pad Thai tastes like because I've never had it before. Because I never ate outside of my comfort zone. And I found that I was actually more limited in what I was eating before my low sodium diet than I was afterwards. And just a quick backing up, I have kidney disease because in my junior year of college here at Stanford, I was diagnosed with a very aggressive attack of the autoimmune disease lupus. It attacked my brain and my kidneys. I went on chemotherapy, I was on apheresis, I was on dialysis, I was on the kidney transplant list, and I was in the hospital for three months um, during my junior year. I eventually stabilized and got out of the hospital, and I survived this initial attack, but my kidneys didn't. Now, I could have functioned as a 21-year-old with the dialysis and being on the kidney transplant list and waiting for a transplant, but I didn't feel like I was really going to live a life that I wanted to live. Um, and I decided at that moment that I would do whatever I could do on top of my wonderful medical care. I had the best medical team you could possibly wish for. But I knew that I had to do whatever I could do on top of that to give my body and the medicine the best chance for working even better. So my kidneys were um, declared absolute renal failure and I started a strict low sodium diet and I just wanted to cut out as much as I could. No one really told me to do that, but I went to eating about 500 to 1000 milligrams of sodium a day, so really low. Um, and slowly over the next year, my kidneys started regenerating, which they still can't explain. Um, I got taken off of dialysis two months before my scheduled kidney transplant, and I've now been officially kicked off the kidney transplant list for almost seven years. So again, everybody, it's all thanks to that food on the table. Um, but again, everybody is different, so that's what worked for me. But uh, it really took taking it into my own hands and deciding I didn't want to live by those rules. I was 21. I wanted to go out and play with my friends. I wanted to travel. I wanted to be able to eat at a restaurant at the last minute and actually get something to eat. I wanted to be a part of a potluck. I wanted to have really good food at my wedding. Um, so those rules weren't going to work for me. And what I found was as I said before, without salt, I actually began to explore just this expansive world of flavor and things that you can do with your cooking and your food that go way beyond salt. And thinking now, you look at this list, which is just a short list of some of my favorite things. Now doesn't salt seem pretty boring to you? <laughs> just a little bit. Um, I know it tastes really good because I liked it too, but there are so many different things you can use. And I always laugh when I tell people I'm on a low sodium, no salt diet. And they say, oh, that sounds so horrible. And I'm just like, check that out. It's actually very exciting. And um, I'm glad you're sitting down because these pictures are a little sexy. But you can actually eat food that looks like this and looks like this and this. And they are really as delicious as that looks. Buffalo wings macaroni and peas, fake scallops. Doesn't that look delicious? And none of that has any salt in it, and it's all low sodium. So it's possible. But I do have to be honest with you. There are some low sodium sacrifices when you are making this switch. And the first is money, and not necessarily with the food itself, because what you'll actually find, it's um, as Nora said, I'm writing a cookbook. I'm cooking about six recipes a day that should feed around an average of six people, and not one day have I spent over $60. Um, and I've been shocked by how little money I'm actually spending on huge amounts of food. And um, I talked to the people at my local Whole Foods, and they said that's because the packaged goods that's full of junk is actually three times as much as fresh ingredients. So the money is not necessarily on the food. The money is being spent at the very beginning of setting up your diet, and that's making your kitchen your favorite place on earth because you are going to be spending a lot of time there. Um, so that means 
outfitting it with all those spices you saw before and getting some good vinegars, champagne vinegar, balsamic vinegar, get crazy. Um, get some good tasting oils, things that you're excited to use. Um, you also want to outfit your kitchen with the tools that are going to make cooking really easy. So get a blender that's easy to take off your shelf. You don't want tools that are sitting up at the top of the cabinet that you're never going to take out that Cuisinart. Put it somewhere on your counter that's easy to use and it's easy to clean. Um, you want to make cooking time to be as effective for you as possible. And then it's little things like put a stereo in your kitchen so you can listen to NPR, you can listen to your favorite artist while you're cooking and you like, you don't feel alone. Or um, the truth is you're gonna make a lot of messes, a lot of them, and you have to be okay with that because um, you are gonna be having a long day and you're tired and you wanna make your dinner and then quinoa is gonna spill all over your kitchen and you have to be prepared for that. So get a little dust back in there, whatever else you need. Um, so it's really about making cooking a pleasurable experience because then you're gonna actually enjoy that part. The next sacrifice is effort. Um, one of the rules that we looked at before was that there are no convenience foods. And you know what? That's okay, because convenience foods aren't very good for you. And 70% of America's sodium intake actually comes from processed foods. And so a lot of this has to do, like our lovely participant said, is you know cooking from scratch. And as you saw in those pictures, you can really make anything from scratch. The only thing I have not been able to recreate without salt is bacon, and I'm still working on it. <laughs> so, um, you know, if if you put in the effort, you can really any craving you have. Sure, it may, may take you a couple tries, it may take longer than a Rachel Ray 30 minute to do, but you can really, if you really want that garden burger for dinner, you can absolutely make it low sodium starting from scratch. And there's a lot of information out there um, these days that can help you do that. And then the last sacrifice is time. And not just time in the kitchen, time in letting your taste buds adjust. Um, I'm careful saying this just because I don't want to seem like I'm attacking salt ever because it definitely has a place in food and has a place in the kitchen. But it's almost like nicotine these days. Our taste buds have been completely oversalted. So when you think of soup from a can, you're not actually thinking about roasted tomato and how that tastes, you're thinking about salt. Um, and that's what your mouth is expecting to actually have. So it does take time to get over that salt addiction, absolutely. It may take up to a couple months, but just keep at it. And um, there's something that I like to call the roasted pepper theory because I didn't know that they were sweet. And um, I remember the first time I bit into a roasted red pepper and it was just this explosion of flavor. And it was this moment when I realized all this time I've been tasting food covered in salt. I haven't been tasting the food. And that whole ingredients actually have a world of flavor in them. Um, turnips and radishes are really spicy. Meat is actually very salty naturally. Um, even things like beets and celery are salty. And then you have things like peppers that are very sweet. And so you can use that to your advantage in actually coaxing out those natural flavors in your cooking and you don't need salt at all. So now who thinks a low sodium diet sounds like a lot of fun? <laughs> okay, we've got a couple more, so I still have some ways to go here. So if you're ready for it, there's three simple steps to making food look and taste like you saw before and having a really successful, really satisfying low sodium diet. And the first is to alter your perspective. You have to go from feeling limited to limitless. Um, I'm assuming everyone here has played the game charades before, probably at some point in their life. It's when you're not allowed to talk and you basically have to get your team to guess what you're doing. And talking in that moment, you think, I can't talk. That's pretty much the only way I can communicate with people. How am I ever going to get my team to guess or know what I'm trying to say without talking? I talk every day. I've been talking since almost I was born. Um, and, it, and then you start realizing, OK, there's got to be other ways to do this, or else this game wouldn't exist. And so how else can I communicate? You realize you can use your arms, you can use your face and your eyes, and you can act things out, and you start getting 
wilder and more creative and taking risks and suddenly you've won the game. Um, everyone thinks you're the coolest person in the room and you're, you actually think you're way more exciting than you were before. And that is exactly what cooking without salt is like. At first you think, well, how can you cook without salt? Everybody I see on TV dumps salt just dump salt into their recipes. Every recipe you have has salt in it. Any cooking show you've ever watched, what's the one thing that they always find fault with? Not enough salt. They say, not enough flavor, you didn't salt it enough. So salt is synonymous with flavor, but like we had kind of gotten to before, as soon as you start thinking less about what you can't use and what you can use, it starts getting to be a lot more fun and a lot more exciting and you realize salt is one thing out of thousands of ways you can flavor a meal. So then the next step, get educated. You need to know where the salt is and more importantly where the salt isn't. Um, the USDA just passed new salt sodium intake regulations. They are now saying that all Americans should be eating around uh, 2,300 milligrams a day or below, and that 50% of the population should actually be at 1,500 and below. Who knows how much salt is in one teaspoon of salt? 2,300, and if you, so that is just the amount you should be eating a day if you're not on a low sodium diet. It's almost double what you should be eating if you're on a low sodium diet. I'm gonna pass this around so you can see just how much, just how little one teaspoon of salt is. And if you actually start paying attention to where the salt is, you'll realize that you can actually get up to the limit just by eating natural foods because salt occurs naturally in meats and even vegetables and in a lot of things that you're eating. Um, and just as an example, we're gonna play a little game. And this is my low sodium showdown. And I'm putting two items against each other. Uh, the first is three ounces of pork versus one artichoke. Which one do you think has the more sodium? And you can keep it to yourself. Second one is one teaspoon of baking powder versus three ounces of clams. And the last is one cup of milk versus three ounces of monkfish, which is a type of fish, seafood. So that, does everybody have their answers in their head? Are they your final answers? <laughs> well, surprisingly, the pork is actually much less than the artichoke. Who would have thought that? I definitely didn't know that until two months ago. I'm learning all the time, too. One teaspoon of baking powder has over a thousand milligrams of sodium. That is your daily intake right there, my friends. But clams are only 40 milligrams of sodium, which I also didn't think. I thought clams, seafood, salt water, most shellfish is really high. Um, but clams are absolutely delicious and they add a lot of flavor to food and you can make great stews with them and throw a few in a fish stew and you've got something really delicious and savory. Um, and then milk, I was eating cereal for years, thinking that I, I was being so good on my low sodium diet. And between um, the amount of sodium in cereal and milk, I was just racking up the points. Um, so the reason why I did this is because whether you're counting calories or counting sodium in your diet, the last thing you wanna be doing is sitting at a table with a calculator and a, and a pad of paper. You don't want to have to be looking this up all the time and you know, reading the labels and asking your waiter, do you know how much is in this? You want to know it for yourself and you want to have that, all that information in your fingertips so that you can really design a diet for yourself and, and boundaries for yourself. I personally decided that I wasn't going to eat any food that naturally had more than 100 milligrams of sodium per serving, which meant all meat was okay except for shellfish other than clams. Um, and when it came to other foods, uh, anything prepared, I decided I'm not going to eat any canned goods that have more than 20 milligrams of sodium per serving. And that really depended on the serving size. So if I was making something with tomato paste, which is, I think it's something like um, 20 milligrams per two tablespoons. See? Start memorizing the stuff. Um, 
that would be okay if I was only using two tablespoons in a recipe, but if it wanted a cup of that, I wasn't going to use it. But by creating those boundaries and knowing the sodium content that well, I can make decisions really quickly, both for the things that I'm buying in the store and what I'm eating in my kitchen and outside of my kitchen. So it really pays to educate yourself. And there are some great sites online, the USDA Nutrient Database. You can type in any food, prepared or otherwise, and it tells you how much sodium is in it. Um, there's also a great book called The Pocket Guide to Low Sodium Foods that is literally a pocket guide. I used to carry it in my purse with me. Um, and uh, you can use those resources in my blog and there's other people out there. Always, you know, go ahead, Google something if you have a question. Um, and it goes beyond the sodium content. It's also about educating yourself on how to cook. Because the more you understand how to cook, the more you understand where sodium will be outside of your kitchen. For years, I thought I was being really safe by ordering steamed vegetables out at restaurants. And I would get it, and they would be so salty. And I, you know, we'd go back and forth with the kitchen, and they'd say we haven't touched it with the salt shaker. But I, I just like, couldn't figure it out. Started cooking more. I started watching more cooking shows, and I realized they were blanching the vegetables every morning in salt water as preparation for the evening shift and I was getting salted vegetables. So again, the more information you have, the easier it is to navigate these very salty waters. Um, and, and finally, always ask if there's something you don't know, whether it's out at a restaurant and you want to know how they prepared it, or you're reading a recipe online and you're, and you're trying to do it without salt and you don't know what chiffonade means. Google it, ask a friend. There's a lot of resources out there for you. I learned how to shuck oysters online, um, <laughs> and now I can do it. Uh, but you know, a lot of what I've learned is just by reading non-sodium related cookbooks and then learning techniques and learning that roasting really brings out flavor or grilling will do something to food or sauteing does something or browning butter gives it this very nutty taste. Um, so look beyond the sodium information too, because you'll learn a lot there as well. And then finally, the third step is be creative and take risks. I watch food shows all day long. I read books about food. It's pretty much all I do in my life. Um, and I feel like a low sodium diet is the ultimate exercise in creativity and risk taking. Um, so you can be proud of yourself for that. And I think of it all the time as my own personal Iron Chef competition, no salt. And how can I do you know, this recipe without salt? And what are the substitutions that I can make? And maybe um, mascarpone cheese can substitute for sour cream because it's lower than sour cream. I don't know how it's going to taste, but I'm just going to go for it. And, and that's when you start really finding just unique flavor combinations. And, and that's when the fun really starts because if you can surprise yourself and surprise your palate, it suddenly has nothing to do with salt anymore. It's suddenly an achievement beyond that. And your guests who do eat salt will actually enjoy eating your food because it's combinations of things and, and unique ways of cooking something that's exciting all unto itself. So on my blog, I have a section called Salt for Your Recipe because I know a lot of people have favorite meals that they miss or they don't think that they'll ever eat again or this is you know something that their grandmother always used to make for them. And this is really how I like showing people that there really is a substitute for almost anything. It may not taste exactly like it, but you can get really close and that's kind of half the fun of trying. So how you salt for your recipe um, is you find a recipe or, and you identify the high sodium ingredients in it. So you have your eye on the things that you cannot use that are too high for you. And then in your head or on paper, you describe what those ingredients taste like and what they look like. Because you can either mimic something in texture or in flavor. Sometimes I will use a substitute that tastes nothing like the original, but it looks a lot like the original. Because you eat with your eyes as much as your mouth. And then I brainstorm potential substitutions. And then finally, like I said, 
I give it a try and worst case scenario is I eat chocolate for dinner, which I do all the time, and that doesn't sound too bad to me. So together, I wanted to salt free a recipe. So for those of you who are on a low sodium diet or are thinking about going on a low sodium diet, I want one recipe or one dish that you know you're going to crave and, and you think you can't eat anymore. Does anybody have one? And you can raise your hand. Pizza. Pizza. Great. So she said pizza. Um, I'm just going to wait one second. She said pizza. And um, does anyone have any idea of where the sodium might be hiding in that pizza? Okay, so we have cheese. We have sauce. We have crust, we have probably pepperoni, we have olives, so we basically have the whole pizza. So how do we do, exactly, so how do we do a salt-free pizza without the high sodium crust, sauce, cheese, and all the toppings under the sun, except for maybe arugula or spinach? Um, it's absolutely possible, I just made deep dish pizza two nights ago. I made my own pizza dough, which is very easy because you make pizza dough with yeast actually, and yeast has no sodium in it. Um, with your trustworthy uh, mixer or your own hands, you knead the dough. It only needs a few hours to rise. It's really easy to do. As for the sauce, you saw on the table, there's actually a very convenient canned sauce. And if you go to true Italian corner stores, they make their pureed tomato without sodium a lot of the time. So it's a good place to go look for tomato sauce. If you want to go for like an Italian corner store or true Italian products actually use less sodium in their products because the salt comes from their cured meats. So they don't use a lot of salt in their cooking. Um, so if you want to go the route of something really fast and easy, you can use one of these canned products that actually exist and add some dried basil, dried oregano, maybe a little cayenne pepper, some pepper, and you've got a delicious sauce. Or you can chop up tomatoes and reduce them in a pot on a low simmer for an hour or in a slow cooker. And again, add all of those delicious things, maybe even chop up some mushrooms to thicken it up, and you've got a delicious low sodium salt-free sauce. So we have our crust now done, and we have our sauce. As for the cheese, where it gets interesting. Um, there does exist online some low sodium cheddar that you can buy. Also in the, and yes, it is a bit tasteless, but if you want the texture of cheese, it's a good thing to use. Um, you can also, uh, there's some low sodium Swiss that exists that's about 30 milligrams per serving. So you could go that route too. And depending what your designed low sodium borders are, you could use a little bit of mozzarella as well as it is a lower sodium cheese. Now, um, I personally don't use any of that. If you want a Parmesan taste, here's a little tip, nutritional yeast. It is yellow. You can find it in a lot of your bulk food bins. It has a, a Parmesan-like taste that you can sprinkle on the pizza, or you can go without the cheese. As for the other toppings, um, sausage, I made my own chorizo the other day, and no, I did not actually crank out with a sausage maker. I bought some um, ground pork, and I spiced it with cumin and cayenne and paprika, and I looked up online what are the spices that go into chorizo. I made it myself. I fried it into a pan and crumbled it up over the pizza. It was outstanding, if I do say so myself. Um, and as for the olives, I just made a Greek salad the other day. And to make the olives, what I did, and this is what I mean by copying texture and look with a little bit of the taste. I thought, okay, olives are tangy and brined, which is salty. Um, they, they have a little bit of a bite to them, um, and I want it to be round or roundish. So I took a yellow beet, and I chopped it into little cubes and then I pickled it in my own pickling vinegar for a day, which was just some mustard and mustard seed, black peppercorn, and vinegar. And it had this nice tang to it. 
And so that would be another option. You could slice some beets and pickle them and put that on top of your pizza if you wanted that vinegary, tangy, kind of brine taste of the olives. So it's not the pizza you had a couple of years ago, but it's a really interesting pizza and it's gonna have a lot of good flavors to it and you can get really close and it's fun to make and when you serve that to your friends, that's way more impressive than the pizza that you just stuck in an oven. Yeah, oh actually I'm gonna take questions at the end if you don't mind holding it. So that's just one example of how you can salt for your recipe and if you want more definitely check out my blog or go ahead and write me a note on my blog and I'm more than happy to figure out substitutions for you because that's one of my favorite things that I do. And before I kind of close up I wanted to say one of the things that we talked about earlier was the sense that you can't eat beyond your own kitchen um, and I think those are the things that I've really learned over the past seven years that aren't true. It does take more work, it does take uh, more creativity than even cooking in your own home, but once you kind of master low sodium cooking at your own stove, you can eat anywhere. You can travel at home and abroad. Um, I have been to a couple different countries since I was diagnosed with kidney failure. Um, the most difficult is we went to Thailand. And I thought, how am I going to eat in Thailand, a, a cuisine that is based on fish sauce? Um, and so what I did was, and I'm gonna pass this around, what I do to eat out in the Bay Area is I have a card that I carry with me all the time, and it says what I can't eat, but more importantly, what I can eat that I give to the kitchen. And I realized early on that if I said what I could eat, they were much more excited and less scared about actually trying. And as soon as I did that, I've been eating some amazing meals over the past seven years. So I'll pass this around so you can see what it looks like. Um, but when I started traveling and thinking, how am I going to eat where I don't speak the language? I actually called the wonderful Stanford Hospital. They translated the cards for me into the language of where I was going. So there is always a way, whether it's olives or traveling to Thailand, there is a way to eat low sodium and still enjoy it to its fullest. I had the most wonderful meals while I was out there. Um, so you can do it. Uh, you can go backpacking. You can eat on the go. Um, another thing to think about though is preparing for emergencies. I didn't think about this until the Haiti earthquake that all of my emergency earthquake kits didn't have any food that I could eat in it. Um, so it's thinking about all of those different kind of nuanced situations where uh, low sodium food will come into play but your doctors wouldn't have ever thought to tell you that because they're not doing it on a day-to-day -day basis like you are. But it's all possible, especially you know when you're backpacking, eating on the go for emergencies, you want things that are lightweight, that can pack well, that will stay good for a long time, they all exist. And then like I was saying before, weddings, dinner parties, eating on somebody else's tab, I know you feel like you're a nuisance and that you are asking somebody to go way beyond um, the call of duty to make food for you. But what I found is the more I actually let people into my world and my kitchen and how I do this, anywhere I go these days, um, they have food for me. I just was at a wonderful couple's house who's sitting right over here for um, their son's going away party and unbeknownst to me she had used my blog to actually create a whole spread of food uh, so that I could eat and when I started this diet there was never an appetizer or tray pass or spread of food that I could ever eat and now anywhere I go there's actually a caterer in San Francisco who did my wedding that um, if he ever thinks I'm going to be at an event he prepares an entire meal for me even if he doesn't know. He just always has a low sodium meal available. And then if I'm not there and somebody requests one, he has it. So think about it less as being a nuisance and more as educating other people. I was on a gluten-free diet before this, way before anybody knew what gluten-free was because I was misdiagnosed. So I, I've had practice. But nobody knew what it was. You could not find anything gluten-free in stores. You definitely couldn't find anything on the menu. I went to um, New Zealand recently for my honeymoon. 
they have gluten-free restaurants, like actual restaurants dedicated to gluten-free food. They have gluten-free at the convenience stores. It's everywhere. Um, and so I think we are on a brink of that with low sodium food as well. It's just going to be a matter of time that we start having low sodium aisles. I just heard the other day a commercial for Safeway that said um, sodium smart, their sodium smart food. So I think we're getting there, we're close. And the more we talk about it and the more we ask people to cook low sodium for us, it uh, will actually reach a wider audience. And then racing, running, playing. Um, if you're athletic at all, in your, or even if you're sick and you need to hydrate and you're drinking those drinks with electrolytes like Gatorade, those are full of sodium. So it's about finding the things that can replenish you but aren't full of sodium. Um, I've been racing in triathlons for the last six years. Um, and uh, this was at the finish of a 56 mile bike ride. So it was really important that I was hydrated and I had to do that, um, figure out a way to do that. And what I found is there are some products out there like the goos on that table that are low enough in sodium that I could eat it. And um, coconut water, which is the new craze, is actually a natural electrolyte replacement and it's zero, very low in sodium, zero to 40 milligrams. And then finally, eating out. This is just one example of the kind of things that I get put in front of me. And I have to say, my food is way more exciting than the people next to me because my food is being made specially with love and care by some of the most amazing chefs. And, and here in the Bay Area, they actually are quite excited to take on the challenge. Um, so as for the rule of no eating out, it's not true. And so that is a life beyond salt way more exciting than you thought it was going to be. Um, and I, I hope I've shown you that um, it really isn't a culinary death sentence, that you can really take health care into your own hands and have fun doing it. Um, my life has been incredibly enriched by it. I've done more, I've seen more, I t I've tasted more than I would have ever done before. So I, I hope I've given you some new tools. Um, and now I would like to open up for questions. He asked that if you are buying something and, and it's a processed packaged food and there isn't a nutri nutrition label, what do you do? Well, it's a nutrition label, but it, but it has, like, you know, say ingredients and then it'll have sodium in one of them. Right, but it doesn't actually show the amount of sodium on it. So it's the nutrition label does not have the sodium content information that you need. Um, what I would do is either not buy it or call the company. I've done it many times where I get on the phone or on the internet and I actually look up that company and see if I can find the nutrition information online. Or if I call, I say, this is my situation. I'd love to buy your product, but I don't know how much sodium is in it. Can you tell me um, where it's been tested? Do you have that information? So if I can get the information that way, then I'll make my decision. And if I can't, I won't use it. And that actually brings up another point. A lot of times, um, companies change their sodium, the, the listing of how much sodium is on the product. So you can look at a product one week and it can say 50 milligrams of sodium per serving. And then two years later, it says 250 milligrams per serving. And what happens is if the company grows, they start cutting corners with costs and adding more salt to their product. Um, so it's really important to constantly turn the label around. Um, she asked, does curry powder, yes I do. Um, she asked, does curry powder have uh, sodium in the, the actual spice and do you have a replacement for soy sauce? Um, that is a fantastic question because it took me a really long time to figure out that certain spice blends do have, they put salt in it as a flavor enhancer and as a filler. Um, so there are a lot of spice companies like Penzi's which is local, has the majority of their line is they have a whole no salt added line. So it's important to look when you're buying your spices. If it doesn't say no salt added, I'd be very wary of it because it probably has salt in it. So it's another thing that you should be looking on the label for. As for soy sauce, good question. Um, soy sauce, so there are, um, well first of all, it depends on your sodium level, but if you can have more than I can, 
uh, depending on what your body needs and what your doctor recommends. They have just come out with a Bragg's liquid amino soy sauce um, substitute that is actually quite low. It's 140 milligrams per serving, which is way too much for me. Um, but it might fit within your dietary guidelines. So that is an option. And I've seen a couple new ones that have come out at Whole Foods lately. So check out um, the Asian, yeah, the, the ethnic foods aisle because there's new stuff popping up all the time. You are going to be spending hours in the grocery store just turning things around. It's so fun. It's like a treasure hunt. Um, as for cooking at home, you can mix... Um, that bouillon comes in beef as well and there's a um, you can look on my site but you can also google it there are a couple um, soy sauce substitutes that is like the beef bouillon some vinegar some molasses and some brown sugar now on its own it doesn't taste anything like soy sauce but when you're using it in a recipe that calls for soy sauce it actually works incredibly well um, it gets close enough to mimicking that flavor and that kind of like interplay of flavors. So I use that a lot when I come across a recipe, like I've made pad thai recently and um, it calls for soy sauce and I use that as my a soy sauce replacement. That's a great question. He asked, is there any low sodium camping food that you can buy off the shelf? And I was actually gone for an entire month doing backpacking trips. So I just went through all this. Um, yes, there is. And I can't remember the name of the company, but if you give me your email address, I'd be more than happy to email you. I actually called them last year, um, right before I went on this backpacking trip and said, can I work with you to develop a sodium-free backpacking food line? And they said, we're a step ahead of you, we're coming out with it next year. So there's going to be more in the future. In the meantime, there's also, um, there's a company called Just Tomatoes, which does a lot of dried peas and, and dried vegetables. And I bring that all the time because you can just throw that in. I pack rice, I pack oatmeal, I pack couscous that are all light. Um, and I, I use that stuff as kind of my um, vegetables. And you can buy online, I think, like dehydrated pork and beans. And then my wonderful mother-in-law actually bought a dehydrator and dehydrated uh, beans for me and a bunch of other snacks. So you can also do it at home yourself. He asked if, if I understand your question correctly, if, if this gentleman starts to lower his salt, will the next generation in his family not need as much salt, not want as much salt in terms of an addiction to salt? Is that correct? Uh, no, what I mean is uh, my, my ancestors are all salt addicted. That's the nature of their food. Um, so has the salt addiction been passed down from generation to generation? Or is it tolerance? Or is it a, is it a genetic thing? I don't, I can't really answer that question. What I can answer is I think we eat a lot how our parents and grandparents eat. We eat those foods. That's what we grow up with. That's what we equate with comfort. You know, that's why I like fried chicken and macaroni so much is that's what I got to eat on Sundays with my father. Um, so I think, you know, it is, it does have to do with a passing down of tradition. I don't know if it's an actual, you know, something genetic going on, but I do think what has happened is generations before us were actually eating a lot less salt. They were eating natural salt. They were putting salt on their food at the table, but they weren't eating the kind of salt we're eating today, which is in our processed foods. They have ratchet it up slowly that so you don't notice how much salt is going into foods these days. It has nothing to do with preserving the food. Um, so I think what has happened is without us knowing it, our taste buds have changed over the last, you know, 50 years because um, how food is being processed and to be made convenient has made it that way. Baked goods. She asked about baked goods and sodium. Baked goods are full of sodium. Um, can anybody guess how much sodium is in your average bagel? 400, over 400 milligrams. Which that just, I mean, not even counting, muffin can be upwards of 500 and 600. Um, it's the baking powder and the baking soda. But here's the thing, 
Um, baking powder and baking soda without sodium is available online and now it's starting to show up in stores as well. And what baking powder and baking soda are actually doing chemically, baking without salt is a whole world unto itself because it has to do with chemistry. Um, and I've just started getting into this. And so it's really understanding how the salt is interacting with the other ingredients and that's how you can figure out good substitutions. And what baking powder and baking soda is doing is giving the ingredients air to rise. So you can either use whipped egg whites as well um, or also uh, things like carbonated drinks and beers like you can make an Irish soda bread is a great example of uh, baking without baking powder and baking soda and using the carbonation to actually have the same chemical reaction. So I'm working with some chefs and pastry chefs on it right now for the, for the book to try to figure out how to make pie crust and, and bread actually taste like they should without the salt. This one is from a restaurant called uh, Barn Diva up in Napa and um, it's a good story because I try to call as often as possible when I know I'm eating somewhere and call ahead of time and let the kitchen know and I ask them, do you mind um, putting aside some meat and vegetables that haven't been marinated and you know, can I, can I send you my list that I showed you? Um, or a lot of times, um, you know, like I formed a relationship with a restaurant so I go back there all the time. This, I was driving somewhere and we were starving and we just dropped in and I thought there is no way I'm going to be able to get something to eat and they said absolutely no problem and that's what came out was this delicious um, plate of fresh greens now I don't eat out at you know takeout restaurants um, and I you know it's it is hard to eat at kind of like the hole in the wall you know quick pickup takeout uh, food places, um, but you also don't have to spend that much money on the food. I just pick places where they're making the food fresh or they have fresh ingredients. Um, and the other thing that I do is using Open Table, you can actually save a note for when you make reservations. And my note, every time I make a reservation through Open Table, it says, These are the things I cannot eat. I have kidney failure. Please set aside some fresh vegetables for me so that when I come I can eat and I can be reached at this number and so it's starting to take the work out of eating when I go and I always have that list with me in my bag that is amazing so she just said that when she went to the movies she actually asked if they can make it without salt and they said that if she came and asked it would take 20 minutes but that they could absolutely do it and that's such I'm so glad you brought that up um, asking is so important you know, I, French fries are my other favorite thing, and I now have all of these restaurants in San Francisco that will absolutely make me French fries without salt. Or if there's, if you have your local pizzeria that you miss that pizza, who brought up pizza? You brought up pizza. Well, let's say. I'm a diabetic. Well, that's a whole other lecture that we're not going to do. Um, we can chat afterwards. Um, <laughs> Let's say you love pizza and that you have your local pizzeria and you absolutely miss it and you are going crazy not having it. Go in, ask to talk to the manager, explain what your situation is, say, and have a very nice, charming, pitiful face on your face and say, this is my situation. Could we work out anything where, let's say I gave you two days lead time or 24 hours lead time, could I come in and could you make me a low sodium pizza with low sodium pizza sauce. What if I gave you all the ingredients you would need? I guarantee you, maybe not that pizza place, but maybe that pizza place will do it. Sure. Just ask. You never, the worst case scenario is they say no. So you never know. So thank you for that. So she listed um, just a wide variety of products that you can find. She said Country, uh, Country Sun Market has a lot of beans and tomatoes and a lot of other products. Trader Joe's. Um, has a great no sodium bread that you can buy and I use it a lot like toast it make you know bread puddings out of it there's actually a couple there's Alvarado Street Bakery also has one um, you are going to start realizing the more you actually start doing this you're gonna realize there is a lot out there for you and it's it makes it substituting for low sodium things so much easier and you're gonna be 
more educated and probably better at this than I am in no time. So um, thank you guys all for your time. If you have any other questions, I'll stick around for a few more minutes before I go sing karaoke. Um, and thank you again. You can always reach me through email at sodiumgirl at gmail.com or go to my website, um, www.sodiumgirl.com. Um, so good luck everyone and uh, go get some good low sodium food.